Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Brennan Center for Justice event at the New York University School of Law here in the heart of Greenwich Village. I am LB Eisen. I'm senior fellow in our justice program at the Brennan Center and your moderator for today's program. As many of you know, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to reform and revitalize, and when necessary, defend our system of democracy and justice. This past year, our organization has been deeply engaged in addressing what we see as a new and alarming assault on the norms of constitutional democracy. You can keep up with our work online at brennancenter.org. <clears throat> Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Watch our videos on YouTube that I just found out about. And listen to our podcast on iTunes. And I believe this podcast will be available on iTunes as well. Today, we are delighted to be hosting Issa Kohler Hausman, Associate Professor of Law and Sociology at Yale University. New York City in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s looked quite different than it does today. It was a city ravaged with crime. Homicides grew to an all-time high in 1990, totaling over 2,000 in just one year. Last year, there were fewer than 290, which, according to the New York Times, is the lowest number since reliable records have been kept. But in the early 1990s, the broken windows theory radically transformed policing practices in New York City and also across the country. That theory predicted that if police addressed the smaller, visible signs of disorder or decay in the neighborhood, such as jumping, subway turnstiles, graffiti, and broken windows, they just might prevent some of the bigger, more serious crimes from occurring at all. In her new book, Misdemeanor Land, <coughs> Criminal Courts and Social Control in the Age of Broken Windows Policing, Professor Issa Kohler Hausman asks, what happens to all of those arrests when they arrive in the courts? We are very grateful that her research has brought Issa Kohler Hausman here to NYU Law and to the Brennan Center for Justice. We're going to start with some questions, and then we'll open it up for um, some Q&A from the audience. So please jot down some questions um, while you're listening so you don't forget them. So in your book, um, which was phenomenal, by the way, and for everyone here, if you haven't read the book, please do pick one up afterwards. Um, it's quite engaging, incredibly accessible, um, very informative. And in your book, you point out that the New York City Police Department has made over four and a half million misdemeanor arrests since the beginning of broken windows policing. For those in the audience, and looking around, I don't know that anyone is less familiar, actually, with this theory of policing, but can you describe its origins and also how this city did or did not respond with adequate court resources to deal with this huge volume of arrests? Sure. First, let me just say thank you so much for having me. A huge fan, of course, of the Brennan Center and all the work here, and it's wonderful to be uh, back at NYU, where I did my PhD for many, many years, and also um, <clears throat> did my research, obviously, and I actually also live here. Um, so the Broken Windows model, um, as many people know, is inspired by this very short 1982 magazine article in The Atlantic, um, where a political scientist and a criminologist, um, <clears throat> Wilson and Keeling, basically set out um, a two-pronged theory. And one theory is that, as LB mentioned, that there's a sort of developmental sequence between um, tolerating low-level crime and low-level disorder and serious violent crime or street crime. Um, and if people get the, the signal from the police and from society that our rules are not being enforced, they feel licensed to commit major crimes, right? This is, that's the sort of developmental ecological thesis. And the other one is just sort of a claim about public preferences, and that was that what people value, what they want from the police, was this actually very traditional role that the police played, and often in the 19th century, not as much of solving serious crimes, but of enforcing social order. So those were the claims. And what's interesting about that Broken Windows article is that it, it actually started off with null findings with respect to the first claim, right? So it cites this study that took place um, of uh, 
police officers getting out of the patrol car and walking a beat, and it didn't really bring down violent crime, but people did report or, um, increased satisfaction with police. So it's important to remember that when this broken windows sort of article was translated into a massive tactical change um, in the nation's largest police force, it was based on really just a hypothesis, really just a hypothesis about the link between low-level crime and serious crime, and also just a claim um, with very very minimal um, um, empirical backing about people's preferences for policing. And on, in the back of that <clears throat> was also um, a very extended period of very, um, I, I don't know how even to, to say this in, to capture just how, how wrenching this was of incredibly explicit racial tension in New York City, right? There had been sort of riots by white police officers about, um, and this was right after the, the Crown Heights um, riots, um, urban uprisings. So, and Giuliani had been really been at the forefront of that, right? Um, in many ways, he had stoked this racial um, antagonism of white officers and white New Yorkers. And so Broken Windows wasn't just the sort of technological fix, that it was deeply inflected um, with race from the start, and it's important to remember that. And so when Giuliani was elected and Bratton was moved from, he had briefly been the head of transit, and then he's appointed head of NYPD, um, they, they put out this policing directive called um, Police Strategy Number 5, Reclaiming the Public Spaces of New York, and it basically says they're going to increase the frequency and the formality of these low-level enforcement actions. So they say, this is really, this is going to be the key to maintaining order in New York City, and we're going to have more of these enforcements because we're going to have more patrol cops, which it actually started under Dinkins, of course. Um, and then we're going to have them more formal, right? So before it used to be that if you, for example, issued a summons, it wasn't docketed. If you didn't show up, nothing happened. So they became obsessed with docketing them, with backing them with warrants, with linking things between systems. And all of that happened, all of this thought about the model of policing, as you mentioned, without much thought what would happen when you flooded all these human beings into New York City's lower courts. And from all my research, I really found that a shockingly little thought seemed to go into what was going to happen in the courts when you essentially double the volume of these cases, when you flooded the, the, the courts with summonses, with low-level arrests. Um, and the one thing that didn't happen was um, a proportionate increase in the uh, in the resources for the various bodies that make up our so-called criminal justice system, right? Courts, prosecutors, and certainly not defense attorneys. And so, and that brings me to another question, which is, your research is a little bit counterintuitive to what a lot of people think might have happened after broken windows when it comes to the courts. So you note that what actually happened in New York City is that misdemeanor conviction rates went down and dismissal rates went up. Um, you know, why is that? This is really the sort of empirical puzzle of uh, the New York City experiment in what we might call mass misdemeanors, right? So, um, and it's not as if, you wouldn't expect that organizations would adapt in some way. It's just that with other criminal justice enforcement, sort of, you know, we're going to get tough on, for example, Rockefeller drug laws. Now, anyone that's looked at the data knows that the real increase in arrests and in convictions and that, and that prison times, conditional on convictions, really didn't happen until about seven or eight years after the uh, Rockefeller drug laws happened. But with all the rhetoric about we have to get tough on drugs, what happened was getting tough on drugs. What happened was an increase in convictions, an increase in um, prison admissions from, um, from drug convictions. But that's not what happened um, in, in misdemeanor land. Um, what happened is that the dismissal rate went up, as you mentioned, um, and the criminal conviction rates, so the proportion of misdemeanor um, cases each year that terminate in a criminal conviction, so a conviction to a misdemeanor offense, went down, such that in recent years, somewhere around 50% of New York City's cases terminate in some form of a dismissal. And uh, of those that terminate in a conviction, the majority are convictions to non-criminal dispositions. So that's what's called colloquially as your discon, your disorderly conduct, 240-20, um, a violation, not a crime, for anyone that's worked and taken pleas in criminal court, right? And so, in fact, Criminal, um, the discon has been the number one conviction in New York City for decades now. And I think the story is partially, um, is partially a story about 
the resources, right? So the, as you mentioned, the resources were not matched by the different agencies, but this isn't just a story of an, of an organization sort of opening the pressure valve and just letting these cases out, right? It's not a story of just dismissing cases, nor is it a story of the sort of uh, evidentiary quality of the cases being lesser, and therefore when the cases are adjudicated, them actually getting either dismissed or um, acquitted. That Neither of those are the story. And what I argue in the book is that there's a fundamental shift in the role of criminal courts between the pre-broken windows era and the post-broken windows era. And you know, there are some terms that you used in your book that I have to confess, you know, I hadn't really heard in the criminal justice context. And I made them up. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and you're a sociologist and you're an attorney. And you know, you, you wrote about how um, attorneys and judges um, in the court system and clerks, you know, what they're doing is is they're marking people, right? And, and that we've moved away from this sort of um, law and order, you know, CSI, what we see on courtroom drama. Um, you know, courtroom scene approach to adjudicating guilt and innocence to something that's quite different. Um, so could you explain you know, what happens in criminal court? What are all these, you know, judges and public defenders and clerks and um, district attorneys spending their days doing? And, and I'd also, two-part question, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. You know, you use the word marking, and I'd love you to, you know, explain what that means. I like that you, I appreciate that you brought up uh, Law and Order, which as any good New Yorker knows, that's actually not the criminal courthouse. Of course, that's a civil courthouse. That's not 100 Center Street. But it's much prettier than the one on 100 Center Street. Um, but it's not just law and order that misleads us, right? We mislead you, as I'm a law professor. Strangely, I'm teaching torts and not crim. But um, you know what we teach in law school is this model that what's the role of criminal courts in the social control sort of enterprise of, of criminal law, right? So criminal law has this list of things you're not supposed to do, the bad things that you know, the society has said is forbidden. And then on the other side, we have punishment. And criminal courts are sort of supposed to sit between you know, the list of the, the penal law that says the things you can't do and the harsh treatment of punishment, which is a glass, obviously, and are supposed to decide who of the people that the police have identified that have accused of doing something actually have done that thing. Right, and that's what that's what criminal procedure is supposed to do. Right, those are the those are the authorized means of testing and collecting evidence, and in that role, the traditional what we teach in in uh, you know crim crim class is that courts are adjudicative entities that they're adjudicating guilt and innocence. Um, but my argument in the book is precisely that that's not what they're doing in this era of broken windows policing, and I just coin a term with hopes of earning royalties mm -hmm. at some point. Um, you know, I, I call it a managerial model. And that term is just meant to capture that what the courts are doing, what criminal law actors are doing, is sorting, managing, testing people over time. So they're using the tools of the criminal process to test, to sort, and to manage people. And so one way in which they do that is marking. Um, and just to give you a, a, a very simple example, the number one disposition in the dismissal category is something called ACD. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that just stands for an adjournment and contemplation of dismissal. And in a huge number of cases, hundreds of thousands of cases, that disposition happens at the very first court appearance. So essentially, instead of even attempting to, to adjudicate, right? I mean, we're talking within 24 hours of arrest, all the prosecutor has is you know, the very limited paperwork from the police department, and then something else, the rap sheet, right? That's the criminal history sheet, um, a very limited write-up. And at that very first court appearance, the, the prosecutor proffers and the judge accepts and the defense accepts something called an adjournment of contemplation of dismissal. And all that does is essentially marks the defendant for a limited amount of time, somewhere between six months and a year. And in many cases, nothing else is required. You don't have to come back to court. Now, sometimes you do. There sometimes can be conditions or a program involved. But in many cases, it's just a mark. And the point of the mark is basically to say, well, um, I don't know if you did this or not, but I'm going to provisionally mark you for the future. 
And if you cycle back, then maybe I'll do something else. But the point is that if we're doing that with a huge number of cases, in some years it was the majority of cases, at the very first court appearance, that's not a system that's adjudicating on the basis of guilt and innocence. Now, we can talk about whether or not it's good or bad. That's a really separate question. This is just a descriptive claim at that point. Well, and so is it good or bad, right? Um, you talk in the book about all of these people who go through the system and you know, what is just so astounding about your book is the interviews um, that you have with impacted people, with actors in the system. And you, spoke, you speak to a lot of people who are in and out of jail, in and out of the court system. And many of them believe that they are innocent of the, um, the, the charges. Mm -hmm. But it's not even a question about whether they'll fight these charges, right? It seems like for some of the people you interview, this idea of guilt or innocence is a sideshow. Um, so can you talk a little bit about some of the interviews that you had with mm -hmm. those people and, and why there's just no attempt um, or motivation to, to really fight their cases? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you think about it, for many people, accepting an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal at the very first court appearance is not only rational, it's sort of irrational not to. I mean, you're being offered a conditional dismissal. You're being offered the opportunity to today um, have the case dismissed and sealed, and you don't even have to come back to court. And the only condition being is that you're not rearrested. Um, and, you know, there's some cases in the book, for example, where, you know, someone starts off saying, well, but I didn't do this, so I want to come back to court. I want to fight the case. And the defense attorney says, um, I'm not trying to dissuade you. You know, you want to fight your case, man? Like, I got you. I'll, I'll come back to court with you. But I just want you to know that at this point in our borough, to get a trial part, we're talking somewhere between 8 to 12 to 14 months. So you're, happy, you're probably going to have to come back eight times, possibly 10 times. Um, and if you weren't on one of those, if you weren't on one of those, the judge can, and in many cases, will set bail. Or, um, you know, or at least if you... The other thing that the defense attorneys are often thinking about is, what's the probability that this person is going to get rearrested? And especially young men of color living in highly policed neighborhoods, there's an incredibly high risk of getting rearrested just for sort of leading normal teen lives. This was, when I was doing my field work, this is the height of marijuana arrests in New York City. An incredibly frequent thing was one person in a group of kids walking down the street was smoking weed. All five were arrested. I mean, people would be cycled in and out with an incredibly high frequency for that. So another thing that the defense attorney might be counseling is, you know, even if you can make the appearances, if you're rearrested, the case is going to be open. They might offer, um, you know, what's the probability that you outlive the six months versus the year to come back to court? And maybe if you have a job, you know, having eight vacation days being eaten up because you got to show up to court at 930, you got to wait in that security line, your case may be, you know, the, the judge says, I'm going to issue warrant if you're not here at 930, but your case isn't going to be called at 930. There's 70, 80 some days, other cases on the calendar that day, you're going to wait to the one o'clock lunch, when it goes down for lunch, you've got to come back for the 2.30 call. You have to find some place to go during that, you know, one to one and a half hours that the court is closed. You can't sit around in the, in the courtroom. So there's an incredible amount of what I call procedural hassle. And another thing that is so interesting about that is that the courts themselves are being sites of social control in a way that in our traditional model of punishment, we think of punishment as being the site where that happens. So it's not as if the courts are just ratifying immediately every decision of the police. They're actually watching the behavior of people that are being fed through the system and calibrating, in some sense, their response. So how well people sort of live up to that procedural hassle and how they perform determines what sort of choose your own adventure or choose the adventures that are highly limited by the institutions of social control um, route people will take. And there's a huge amount of sorting and differentiation that happens within the instrumentalities of courts. So for me, reading this book, and I'm a former assistant DA um, in New York City, and one of the most interesting parts of your book was that no one is trained to do this. And so you started out saying, we teach criminal law Right? We teach criminal procedure. Um, we teach these you know, Supreme Court precedents and 
um, you know, people are graduating law school, very idealistic about the power of the law to change the world, um, and they're thrown in court, whether they're a public defender or a district attorney, and now in some cases even judges, with no training about how to, you know, to, to borrow your, your, your phrase, you'll start getting royalties now, um, sort of this managerial justice approach, nobody learns that. Right? There's no class in law school about, okay, if you're a public defender and you know, this is what you do to make sure that someone comes back to court or, you know, what does that, yeah. you know, doing this research, I mean, is that scary? Is that frightening? Is there something that law schools should be doing? Is there training that should be happening? You know, we're, we're, we're now in this world where people are, in these incredibly powerful positions, you know, we talk a lot about the Brennan Center about the power of prosecutors, but they've really never received training to work in very, very busy urban courtrooms. Yeah. The, the yeah. way they, they, they need to sort of manage these cases today. And so, you know, as a professor, someone who's reached this, are there solutions? Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because like, there, there's two levels of that question. And one is this sort of wonky, um, uh, sociological explanatory level and that I want to address briefly, which is I think so often we explain things by thinking that there's a plan from the top and then organizations implement it. And that's not the story or that people have preferences or ends or goals they're seeking and that they're and then they're implementing those. But what's interesting about this story is that no one from the top of the prosecutor's office or no judge or n no one as far as I could find said, you know what, we're going to fundamentally change the role of lower criminal courts from adjudicating mm -hmm. offenses to basically managing and testing people over time. Instead, what happened was a series of sort of creative adaptations to immediate problems that frontline actors on the ground level of organizations had to make, and that then sort of percolated up in the terms of, in, in the form of organizational solutions. So one of the things that's interesting about the early, the mid 90s is right when these cases were flooded, there was this massive increase in the number of um, pretrial hearings, and cases of actually contestation, and then that what within less than two years that immediately drops, and you have down to less than one half of one percent of these cases going to trial, less than a thousand pretrial hearings out of a quarter of a million misdemeanor docket filings. So there's no law happening here, guys. Like, and and it starts off as this form of contestation, but then there sort of settles into this equilibrium of we have to figure out a different way to do this. And I think what essentially happened is the prosecutor had to change their standard offer policies. So instead of, it was that, you know, one of the things that we're looking at now with my co-authors in this other quantitative project, it started off that you had about a 40 to 50% probability of conviction before broken windows policing, you know, holding constant certain things. Now it's closer to 10, and that's because the offer policies, mm -hmm. I think, changed. And now you can see them, they're standardized, but some of the old timers from the prosecutor's office that I was around said we had to change certain things. And many of the frontline ADAs said, you know, of course cases were gonna 30-30 out, that's get dismissed um, speedy trial. Or of course I had to, you know, be serious about some cases and not others, and I had to make standard offers that were much lower. So in some sense, they had to make these ad adaptations, but when you look at it from a system level, it means that the system is functioning in a different way without anyone of having set off that, that plan. Um, so that answers one part, but I think that what we should do is a much larger question. I don't know if I wanted. Well, have any schools that you know of, or, or has there been any discussion in the field about training court actors to deal with what's happening in busy criminal courts? And, and I know, yeah. um, you know, uh, there's this, um, podcast serial that I think a lot of people in the room listen to, and um, Sarah Koenig is in Cleveland courts, in cl the Cleveland criminal court, and she has sort of unprecedented, unprecedented access and has found a lot mm. of the same um, challenges in the courts there. And so this is you know, far greater, um, a, a bigger challenge than just New York City. Right. Um, you know, it, it would be interesting to see um, sort of a call to action, I, I think, you know, what we do and should we be training court actors um, right. better about how to dispense justice in 2018? Well, I think that in some sense it, it points up a different question of what 
what doing justice for prosecutors means. So traditionally, I think they're taught, which is, you know, um, we have an adversarial system, and it's your job not, you know, to, um, you know, to represent the victim or represent society if there's not a direct complaining witness. And um, you can always sort of say, well, you know what, we can fight the case. We can have a jury decide. We can have a judge decide. And one thing that we know is that that's not how our criminal justice system works anymore. Mist misdemeanor land, trials have gone the way of the dodo bird. I mean, it, you might, they're just, they're statistically non-existent. In felony land, you know what, in state court, five, six percent, mm -hmm. in federal court, I think about the it's same. Even, yeah. yeah, I mean, so we have a system that some people, including Rachel Barkow here, has you know pointed out is what we could think of as quasi-administrative or quasi-inquisitorial. And so that means that the prosecutor is both the judge and the jury. And so what doing justice means now has to be um, both you know, taking seriously your job that you are the adjudicator, but also on the low level, I think it's taking seriously that what the standard offers are mm -hmm. set, whatever in that middle or upper rung of the office, and I don't fully, you know, obviously that's going to vary by office to office, often is what is going to happen, especially in lower courts, because the cost of adjudication, as you pointed out in your very first question, is almost always going to outweigh right. what's offered. And so that means that setting those standard offers is really going to be, you know, kind of the big moral point. Um, but in terms of training, yeah, I think it's just un like maybe teaching sociological realities as opposed to doctrinal fantasies. Um, you know, might be the first step. <laughs> and to, um, you, there are a lot of students in the room and um, a lot of aspiring writers and aspiring sociologists here. Um, Sorry, guys. You, you, you are not only a sociologist, <laughs> but you're a lawyer and, and, and I would say almost a journalist. And in your book, you really traverse so deftly between providing anecdotes um, about your own research, your own experiences in the courtroom, um, then you, you, you discuss these complicated data sets, um, you have graphs and visualizations and historical research. What was the writing process like for you? I mean, it, it's very rare to encounter a book that is just so, com so comprehensive um, fr fr from all of the different perspectives that you provide. And so I'm just curious, I know, I know this um, stemmed from your dissertation, so um, I know everyone here would love to hear really how you came about to this topic mm. um, as part of your dissertation and, you know, what the writing process was like. Writing is pain and suffering. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't... Um, I mean, I started this project in 2004, the year after my first year of law school, and I was driving in the car with my sister, who's a historian up at Cornell, and she also works on the sort of punitive turn in both welfare and penal policy in the 1970s. And we were driving, and, you know, this was 2004, everyone who was anyone, like all the cool cats were studying mass incarceration. I think David Garland had just coined the term. Um, he was definitely getting royalties. And, um, uh, and I was thinking, huh, like, but what about misdemeanors? And I remember going home and using my really crappy internet, you know, that's very slow, and just looking up. I was living in Cook, I was living in Chicago at the time, and looking up, and I just thought, there's so many more misdemeanors than there are felonies. And that was literally the the, the research question in 2004, my first year of graduate school. Um, and I marched into my advisor's office and I said, I'm gonna study misdemeanors. And he was like, that is such a stupid idea. Like, who cares? And then he kind of changed his tune and said, well, you know, no one else is studying it. And, you know, um, and, and I then found Malcolm Feely's book, which was at that, you know, it was really the only thing that had been written. And I applied to a bunch of NSF grants and I got rejected from every single one of them. And then I applied for a bunch more grants and I got rejected from every single one of them. Um, because when you start a new area that there aren't sort of highly developed uh, literature and hypotheses that are already out there to be tested, I didn't really know what my research question. My research question was basically, what's up with misdemeanors? I don't know. Um, and then I, you know, went back to law school, and then I applied for one job at the Legal Aid Society, and they uh, rejected me. And so, see, lots of stories of rejection. <laughs> or they lost my application. To this day, I don't know. I'd like to think they lost my application, but it's entirely possible that they rejected me. It was their loss. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, and, and so I went back to graduate school because I didn't have a job. And so, obviously, you know, you get a PhD when you're unemployed. And, um, and I moved to New York because my advisor moved to New York. And it turns out this is an amazing place to study misdemeanors. 
misdemeanors. And I actually, you know, this turns out this is sort of ground zero for the rollout of this. And I just went into court and just sat there for the first couple of months. And I was writing down what was happening. I had no idea what was happening. But I just kept thinking it was interesting that everyone was walking out of the courtroom. <laughs> They weren't walking back to the pens. They were walking out. And I was like, whatever is happening here is not all these books that I've been reading about the story of penal control as being one of warehousing, removal, permanent marking. It just seemed that there's something interesting about what was happening on the lower end, and it was different. People were cycling in and out of different provisionally marked statuses. They were having to deal with entanglements, like little hooks in the flesh pulling you back into this oppressive system as opposed to total institutions of control like prison, you know? Um, they were being tested on these little sort of behavioral things like I have a letter from my pastor, I pay my child support, things that just didn't seem relevant because all these years I was working to pay my rent for an 18B attorney doing, you know, you know, for our murder clients, it's not like you could bring a letter. But you know what? He pays his child support. Maybe we can ACD this, right? So clearly there was a different logic of punishment going on. And so it really flowed that way. Um, and then, you know, petitioning DCJS, which I will have to say the Department of Criminal Justice Services is really the standout amazing agency that wants to provide data, that um, is incredibly open. And so um, I, the one grant of all of graduate of eight years that I got could purchase this 30 years of data, that was amazing. Um, and then the, some of the other stuff from the NYPD, that was a four year lawsuit. You can look it up, First Department, Kohler Hausman v. NYPD. Um, ended up having to sue them for that, so that was my first FOIL case, that was fun. Um, but it's, it's painful and it's back and forth and you know it's provisional. Um, and even when you publish something, you're never positive, you're never sure, and there, there's still things you can learn. Um, but it's, it's been an honor to work with the, the people who talked to me and that wanted to share their stories and that made me understand I will forever be grateful to them. And was it hard? So you interviewed a lot of judges and public defenders and district attorneys, and I know you were careful not to use names and, or even not to use boroughs, and I'm very curious which boroughs you were in, but I know you're not supposed to um, let, let us know, but were, were people reluctant to talk to you? What was that process like? Um, it's, it's always a, a back and forth. Um, you know, district attorney's offices, unsurprisingly, are the most um, reticent. And so I sort of got access at first and then was frozen out and then amazingly got access again because a good friend of mine's father was a retired um, detective on the NYPD who was detail to uh, the, one of the DAs and so was amazingly able to get access again. Um, and so it's, and some of them were very, a lot of people love to talk about their job. They like to tell you things. And, um, you know, defense attorneys, you know, some, again, sometimes, it's often the people at the top are the hardest ones to get in with. And often they're the ones, you know, no offense to managers in the room, that talk in the most abstract platitudes, right? Well, we do justice, and we like to make sure that cases are, you know, and it's, oh, okay, I'm going to write that down. Like, that's, that's going to be great data. Um, you know, and, but you often talk to them just to get licensed. I mean, really, what I find the most interesting is, what are the people on the ground doing? What are the understandings that inform that? And what are the constraints that they face that make sense of their actions. So I always thought of it as a triangulation, right? The quantitative data sort of shows regularities, but it's not, it's not to prove a, a story, it's to sort of show regularities that are consistent with something. Um, and then the qualitative data explains what it means, what are the meanings that are brought to this, what are the constraints under which people are acting. Um, and then, I, again, the, the, the people that I'm the most um, indebted to are the defendants. I mean, you try to ask someone who just had one of the most traumatizing experiences. You know, they were put in metal cuffs on the street, humiliating, violent act. They were kept in a cage with 20, 30 other human beings with a toilet in the side of the room. They had to sleep in that room overnight. They felt humiliated in front of a judge. They haven't brushed their teeth. They haven't, they've eaten these, you know, they had these sandwiches that are this white bread and these fake, you know, people who are shaking their heads that have seen, the, you know, like in, if you've worked in the courts, you've seen these boxes and these crates. I mean, it's traumatizing. And to go up to someone and say, hi, my name is Isa Kohler Houseman. I'm a PhD student. Can I ask you some questions about this really awful experience? I know you want to go home and take a shower, but how about you sit down with me for an hour and talk to me about your experience? And many people did and, and wanted to share it. And I think that that's a testament to how much they want to have their voices and their experiences understood in this. 
And we're glad that you um, pursued, you know, we're glad that you asked those, those questions because that, you know, the stories are in the book and um, they're heartbreaking, um, especially when you wrote about why some of these people were arrested, um, yeah. specifically, I think in um, one of your chapters, you write about someone who was taking up two seats on the subway, mm -hmm. who was arrested for that. Um, and last question, because we want to move on to audience questions as well. But your research really focuses on New York City criminal courts, but certainly has findings that are useful across the country. Um, are you working to implement any findings? And you know, what? How do you see your research being most useful for people who are you know listening to this podcast in Cleveland, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, in Cook County? Right. Um, so disposition data, meaning the outcomes of cases, is some of the hardest data about misdemeanors to find. You know, we have a lot of disposition data about felonies, but not misdemeanors. Um, um, there's uh, two um, criminal law professors uh, that have published a couple of papers, Mason and Stevens, on that have collected a, you know an amazing data from a number of cities, and in many of those cities, in fact, most of them. I was interested to learn that non-conviction is also one of the most common outcomes for misdemeanors. So it turns out in many cities, non-conviction and therefore probably repeated arrest is really the sort of social control story that we need to be looking at. And so um, I think that there's a couple of policy insights. And so therefore these experiences, marking, hassling, performance, entanglement, fees, fines, humiliation at the hands of the state, right? That's really, I think, a, a very different from how we've studied mass incarceration, which is a permanent status, warehousing, a disruption in the life course, right? Um, so I think one of the major things that, that uh, New York has that should be protected and exported is our criminal um, ceiling laws. Mm -hmm. So in New York State, a case that terminates in a non-conviction should, ought to be, actually fully sealed from the rap sheet and not accessible. Unfortunately, the NYPD is a, a pattern and practice of maintaining, has a massive database of sealed arrests and uses them on a regular basis. There's a class action that was just filed up in the Bronx um, by the Bronx Defender's Office in Cleary. Um, and I it's, I'm, was very, very upset and, and uh, sad to learn that the city, of course, is you know, fighting this when they should say, oh my god, this is terrible. Let's, you know, we should stop doing this. Um, but criminal, it's sealing of records. So the people that are the most at risk, I think, of getting arrested and non-convicted, then are also the highest risk of having those records being used adversely in credit in, um, you know, um, housing, um, you know, mugshots.com, right? All this, this, this type of thing. So I think sealing records. Um, and then frankly, just having the hard discussion of do we need to be arresting for these things? And then of course, is the work that you guys are doing here, you know, cities and states is absolutely morally appalling that we've decided to have a revenue source, um, a, a regressive revenue source in, in court fees, fines. Um, so there's a number of things I could keep going, but I'm sure that'll come up in the Q&A too. Um, so thank you so much for, for answering all of these questions. And I know that we have a lot of practitioners in the room um, who work in uh, the criminal courts in New York City in and around the courts. Um, so we'd love to open it up to audience questions. So there's a mic um, up there. And so if people who have questions want to uh, make their way up to the microphone <coughs> on this side of the room. It's a good walk. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm over at John Jay College, and I'm looking at the um, transinstitutionalization of the seriously mentally ill. And I was just wondering if you looked at demographics of the population and to what extent race played a factor or mental illness played a factor. Yeah, I mean, I think for the, there's, there are, you know, a small, um, but a number of people that just have a, a very hard, high number of misdemeanor arrests. And it's clear that many of those people are homeless and struggling with very severe mental illness and sometimes also drug addiction and mental illness. And I know that the city has taken some steps recently to try to deal with that population because it's just, to say that it's, um, not helpful is an understatement to be continuing to arrest. I mean, I think it's inhumane, it's, um, it's costly, it's idiotic. I mean, this isn't 
you know, someone who's going to react to this incentive structure. If you, you know, come back, we're going to add five more days to your jail sentence. I mean, it's, and obviously the treatment, um, you know, available at Rikers Island is not sufficient. And so I think that obviously race plays a, a part in, in many aspects. I mean, all the way down from just the conditions that make it more likely that certain people are going to not get adequate treatment from society. Um, but I think the most important thing is that we have to, unfortunately, there's just no criminal justice solution. Either we're willing as a society to put substantially more money into housing, treatment, and wraparound services, or this is what's going to happen. I mean, it's just the predictable outcome. And I don't, I think the try of jiggering like mental health court for misdemeanor, it's just, it's not a, a criminal justice problem. It's that people need expensive services, and we as a society have to be willing to do that. <laughs> well, it's, also, it's, it's so much socially driven, and you know, Jack Young, you wrote a lot about it. it's social control, and you're, we're labeling people as outsiders, which is what you're really looking at, and they become that identity. They're, they're deviant, they just cycle in, and we can't pull them out. So it's great research. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Hi. Um, I have two questions about uh, street encounters in the post-Floyd landscape. Mm -hmm. Um, so for my impression, police officers, um, POs, sergeants, sometimes lieutenants either don't know or don't care for the gradients still needed in DeBoer um, as to when or when or not they um, can approach. So I'm wondering if um, post Floyd, if you've seen any difference from that or if you've looked into like the 250 Stop at first data, which is definitely like missing a significant portion of street encounters that happen. Um, and then with that and with you know officers instigating interactions, um, time and time again you see someone coming in with the trifecta of OGA, discount, and resisting arrest. Mm -hmm. um, resisting arrest is not supposed to be someone's top charge, um, but so often is. Um, and discount very interestingly has a mens rea component and few police officers know that or know the precise um, subsections of DISCON. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of like police instigation, um, thoughts on the Fourth Amendment, police officers like truly understanding and or abiding by that, um, and then if you're seeing a lot of DISCON alone, but specifically DISCON OGIN. Mm -hmm. Great, there's so much in that question. I think what's so interesting about the post Floyd period is that this shift that's happened in the the valence, the important, the relevance of the 250. So prior to Floyd, of course, um, you know, the Comstat era is marked by two things, one of which being the use of low level enforcement as a performance metric up and down this hierarchy of the police department. So low-level officers, when you talk to them, especially when I was doing my field work in, from, you know, 09 to 2012, 13, up to 14, they would say, look, you know, at the end of the month, I have to turn my activity report on, and if I don't have a good number of 250s, those are the forms that you filled out for the stop, question, and frisk, um, summonses and misdemeanor arrests, my supervisor is going to say, is there something going on at home? I'm worried about you. So they're not going to enforce this, you know, a quota in this explicit way, but they're going to make very clear that I haven't been active. And then you talk to um, mid-ranking people in the police department and they'd say, look, if I go to the Comstat meeting and there's a 0.01% uptick, uptick in my index crime, the only thing that I can sort of offer on the altar to the brass is we're doing what we can, we're out there being aggressive, we're doing our stops, we're doing our summonses, we're doing our misdemeanor arrests. You know, this was, again, on the broken windows model, this was like the currency of what effectiveness was. And then suddenly, you know, Floyd, actually even before the decision even came out, right? And then post Floyd, 250s are bad, you don't want to have too many. And so everyone knows they're radically underreported right now. And it's not clear that the data really mean anything. I don't really know what the hell to make. As a social scientist, I, if someone tried to send a paper of what these data meant, I would say, I don't, I think garbage in, garbage out. I don't think they mean anything. Um, but the second part of your question is really, you know, 
how do you enforce how do you enforce that police actually conform their actions to the content of constitutional rules, right? That you can't just go stick in your hands in people's pockets because you want to know what's in their pockets. Um, well, one thing that's not effective is the exclusionary rule, right? Which is, again, the only doctrine that the Fourth Amendment puts out there, which is then if you want to use the thing that you found in his pocket in a trial, you're not allowed to. Officers don't know what happened to the most of the arrests. Obviously, as we know, most of those arrests don't go to trial, and they rarely give a shit what happens in those arrests, unless, of course, it's a resisting arrest charge. And so if you were an organization, think about it, you're a firm, right? And you're trying to actually get frontline actors' um, behavior to conform to a certain standard of rules, you wouldn't have an audit mechanism one in a million, right? You would do something else. You would audit the behavior in a different way, and you would tie um, negative responses to things that they do care about, like vacation days or positive posts. I mean, officers care about a lot of things, but they don't care about what happens to one of their multiple marijuana arrests. And so if you're an organization that cared about that, you would come up with different mechanisms to do that. Um, and you would audit things in different ways. And I hope to see the police doing more of that. But instead, of course, what you see is more fighting for opacity, for hiding records, for not sharing records. Um, and the going down the road is a whole nother. <laughs> um, that I, don't, I haven't seen an increase. I mean, discon is not a very big arrest charge. It's a disposition charge, because the top charge is some form of a misdemeanor. And usually, disorderly conduct is used just as a um, as a, as a marking mechanism, actually. It's just because the, the conditional discharge marks the record for a year. But there's so much more we can talk after about that. Thank you for your question. And that point about the incentive is, is such a great point, because in our justice program at the Brennan Center, we do a lot of work around shifting the incentives of the actors in the justice system, right? Because if you change the incentives, you change the behavior. Um, so, so maybe that's your, your next book, is looking yeah. at that research as a possible solution. Um, but I know you have a question as well. My question kind of ties into that. My name is Charlie Agus. I'm a public defender in Johnny Anna County, New Mexico, which is right on the border. And I think it's great that you're telling this narrative, this side of the mass incarceration story. I'm in the magistrate. I'm in the magistrate court, so I deal with just personally. I have hundreds and hundreds of misdemeanor courts that I'm dealing with all the time. So what you write about definitely rings true. And I think uh, you got you got asked about how this story varies across space or the United States a little bit. So I think what I wanted to ask you about is uh, the role of money. So one thing I noticed is, what I, one thing I noticed in Doniana County is a lot of their prosecutors on the lower level get their money from the federal VAWA grant. So because of that, there are, pe the, there are prosecutors whose whole position is devoted towards uh, getting as many domestic violence cases as possible. So you have the state sort of intruding into the, the realm of the family, and whenever there's an argument, a lot of times we'll get cases where you know the public uh, public defenders are conflicted out because you know the boyfriend and the girlfriend you know, both get cases against each other, and there's this tremendous state power basically being used to rip apart a personal relationship. But I know different jurisdictions have different incentives, like you were mentioning uh, with uh, the Brennan Center. I know in New York City they get a lot of terrorism grants. So um, I was wanted to ask you about those sorts of incentives, and obviously money plays a huge role in terms of the defendants and the fines they get, the warrant fees, and keeping them in the system. As well. That is such such an important um, point, and just fascinating. I I, th I haven't studied that as much. I would I hope that the Brennan Center or other people look at that, but that's I think especially in smaller jurisdictions, federal grants that are specific for problem areas are deeply problematic in the way that you explain in terms of creating sort of a market, a pull for certain types of cases, and then warping the incentive to deal with them in a way that is just and fair and you know seeks resolution of very real problems without, you know, um, you know, just kind of playing, look, I worked in nonprofits for years and I as, as someone who had to apply for grants and you know you think about the way that you're judged and the things that you, the metrics that you have to show to keep your funding up anyone that tells you that doesn't have an effect is delusional or lying or I don't I don't know but um, so that's that's a really important issue and I think that probably varies a lot between jurisdiction um, but the domestic violence part is another I'm really glad that you asked that too because um, you know for years all the years that I was doing my research the number one charges were all officer initiated. Um, 
you know, for 13 years, marijuana was the number one arrest charge. Then um, uh, criminal possession of narcotics, um, turnstile jumping, trespass in the vertical sweep cases. And now it's assault three. Um, and a lot of those assault threes are domestic violence cases. And, and this is very difficult. Nobody, nobody comes to this in the position that, you know, uh, domestic violence is anything but s deeply problematic and wrong. But anyone that tells you that it's simple has not spent time with real human beings that have very difficult, um, stressful lives. They're living in poverty. They're living with multiple people in a house. There's a lot of different dynamics. It's not always obvious who is the abuser, who's not the abuser. Sometimes the abuser really actually does want help, and the, the offices often, you know, they're protecting themselves. So the first thing is full order of protection, no drop. So the cases are going to stay open for the entire life of the case. What that means is someone's going to, and sometimes when it's kids, and a lot, all these, a lot of these cases where I was studying would be family cases. It would be a teen that was living with grandma, um, and the neighbors called the police. Full order of protection. That means that kid is going to a shelter. And often grandma doesn't want the kid to go to the shelter, so she allows him to come back in. Well, now he's in violation of the order of protection. And if the NYPD does a random house check, now he's arrested for contempt. And the office is constantly in this posture. And I'm curious, I'll be like, maybe you have some insight in this, but there seemed to me the posture was just, I don't want to be that New York Post guy. Mm -hmm. Like, all I care about is not, is I'm going to maintain the toughest stance. And if 30-30 is out, that's not on me, but I'm going to maintain full order of protection. Um, you know, and that's really difficult, I think, because we're often not being attentive to the fact that there is variation in the actual risk, and this has very serious effects, especially on households that have very limited resources. And I think it's starting to change. Um, I mean, I remember when I was a D an ADA, uh, and the NYPD was required to arrest someone um, the second they were called for a domestic violence case. Um, and then it was up to the prosecutor to decide whether to pursue that case um, in the complaint room. And you know, we, we were told to look at pictures, but again, you didn't want to be that that prosecutor, that junior prosecutor that had dismissed the case, yeah. and then find out something terrible happened, um, and have you know, you know, realize that that was or feel like that was your fault because you didn't proceed. Um, and you know, the same thing with bail. And I do think that is starting to change. I think prosecutors across the country are um, really looking at their bail practices, um, their charging practices, asking for more and more evidence um, when cases are brought to them in the complaint room. Um, but it's it's you know it's it's going to take decades, I think, to mm -hmm. really figure this out. Um, and it is. It's, it's very tricky. And the same thing with judges. Right? Oh, judges yeah. judges uh, are elected in on almost every county in this country, um, state judges, county judges. And um, judges also don't want to be on the front page of the paper for um, you know, not, not sending someone to jail or releasing them. Yeah. Um, so very complicated question. And on your incentive question as well, um, check out. Um, I do work at the Brennan Center for Justice. I want to plug. We, we wrote a report a couple of years ago called um, Reforming Funding to Reduce Mass Incarceration. It's on our website, Brennan Center www.brennancenter.org, um, and it looks at the power of federal grants um, oh, to change practices and how even those um, questions that the grant that are sent out um, with mm -hmm. grants, so for this report looks at the burn jag funding that's sent from the federal government to all localities and states in the country, um, and we uh, found that the questions that DOJ was asking about the grants at the time was, was um, causing jurisdictions to um, use that money in a specific way, like hiring um, more officers to work on <coughs> drug task forces and seize more drugs because the questions asked about seizing drugs and seizing cocaine and seizing guns. Um, and the D DOJ did actually change uh, their questions um, after that report was issued. But I think it speaks to the, the very real power of federal dollars to um, to, to create um, criminal justice um, behaviors. Hi, um, I have a comment and then also a question. Um, my comment concerns your, um, your work on the, the judicial management of people's lives through the court process. And my experience has been that um, one area that really needs to be addressed 
immediately is the slow pace at which dismissals of claims brought by the prosecutor's office um, are actually uh, signed by the court and people are released. There's a big delay between you know, the, the moment when in a court a, person, uh, a person's charges are dismissed and the point where the judge actually signs the order which releases that person from jail. So I'm talking about the group of people who are sent to Rikers, not, not sent home on a provisional dismissal. Um, so I really think that's an example of, of judicial management that's gone completely awry. When the people's claims are dismissed, they should be sent home right then and not forced to wait six weeks you know, um, for those those orders to be carried out because of a busy docket. Um, and my question to you uh, concerns sealing of records versus, um, versus expungement. So um, you're talking about sealing. What about, what about just expunging you know, um, versus sealing? Yeah. As I, I know in New Jersey there's a movement afoot to tie you know, expunging of claims to legislation about um, legalizing marijuana. Um, and so I'm curious to know if you can come across that as a, as a policy question. Yeah, that's great. I mean, so New York just um, enacted its first expungement law. Prior to that, there was no expungement. Um, it's a process, you know, it's not automatic. You have to apply. Um, there is, Legal Aid does have a project uh, that, for help, but that is, that's a new, uh, a new project, a new possibility under New York law, and that's great. But I would agree that I think that there's certain things, you know, perhaps now with a new Democratic Senate, um, you know, maybe we'll get a Democratic governor too, but um, it would be, I uh, <laughs> hope you're listening, Cuomo. Um, <clears throat> but uh, with the new Democratic Senate, maybe we will pass um, legislation that will legalize marijuana, and maybe there will be a movement for automatic expungement. I think there should be an automatic expungement for, um, for marijuana offenses. Uh, that's clear. I mean, it's, again, in New York City, 60,000 at the height arrests for marijuana arrests. Um, those didn't all terminate in conviction, but again, people at the highest risk of multiple arrests probably did. So my sense is that, you know, perhaps there could be of these categories that now, for example, you know, turnstile jumping, you know, if all the DAs are going to, across the borough, are going to categorically DP turnstile jumping, maybe there should be movement for automatic expungement. Again, anytime you have a lengthy process that requires people to get papers, to get, to get their, you know, their final disposition paperwork, to get an affidavit, to do this, it's going to disincentivize it as opposed to just have automatic expungement. Thank you. You made a comment earlier that the standard offer a prosecutor makes in misdemeanor court is set by someone higher up in the management hierarchy. Uh, did you find in your research that the actors and public defenders in the prosecutors were relatively disempowered in their organizations in misdemeanor court, and if you did, uh, what did you make of that? That's a really interesting question. Um, so in the boroughs that I worked in, and in pretty much every borough, my understanding is that not only their standard offers, but those standard offers are, you know, I've, I've seen them when I would work in arraignments. You know, you, you're working right next to each other. You could, you'd see their offer sheet. And when I was doing my research, sometimes they would show it to me. It's a little matrix, you know, kind of like the federal sentencing matrix. It's the number of prior arrests and the arrest charge. Um, it's, it's not that they're disempowered. It's, it's exactly what they were saying. It's the sense of under what constraints do they feel they would want to do that. So one former prosecutor that I um, interviewed, I remember saying, look, at the height, you know, at the height of broken windows, policing. now obviously misdemeanor arrests have gone down substantially, but still, you know, it's a busy day. You might have 70, 80, 90 cases in an arraignment shift. You, you're looking at the papers for two seconds. You know, uh, it's a, you know, it's a turnstile jump. The, dis the defense attorney comes over and says, my guy says that he swiped a, a, his card twice. There was money on it. It didn't go through, and he jumped over and ran the train, but he has an unlimited card but the officer um, took it and threw it away. You know, the, the DA is gonna say, I don't know <laughs> what happened. You know what I mean? There's 70 other cases on. I don't know what happened. I'm not gonna take this time to do it. Okay, like ACD with one day community service as opposed to two, maybe. Or like, well, if that's your guy's story, come back and fight the case, right? I mean, so it's not as if 
sometimes they are disempowered. Sometimes they just don't feel that they would want to exercise. They're not actually disempowered. They just feel that they wouldn't want to exercise it because they worry that they, you know, they have certain values and they think, you know, without proving to me that you're innocent at this moment, I, why would I do anything differently? Um, so I don't know. And so, yes, certainly there is variation in prosecutorial culture and like, you know, offices where people tended to, you know, there, there certainly is and that, that's important, like getting good prosecutors, you know, I think really matters. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, prosecutors are prosecutors. And so, again, we also have to think about that's why I think the answer to some of these things is less arrests. Because, you know, prosecutors prosecute cases and they feel that that's not their job to th throw it out unless they're really fully convinced that there's no case here. And that, um, that turnstile jumping case with the Metro card, that was an actual case from your book. One, uh, yeah, yes. he, had, he had like sweat. There was two and, similar. And I think it yeah, actually yes. went to trial, right? Yeah. Or there were a lot yeah. of hearings yeah. about it. One of them went to trial. Yeah. Actually, he had the Metro card, and they verified that it was an unlimited card, and they still prosecuted him for attempted jumping of a turnstile mm -hmm. because the officer said that he put his body like this. And then when he saw the officer, he went back and swiped it. I mean, it was really the most insane thing. And this is talking another perverse incentive, not to... I mean, one, my best friend teaches at Cardozo, but there is a clinic, there's a prosecutorial clinic there, and there was, and the student tried the case, and I sometimes think that when they're trying to give mm. students experience in these prosecutorial externships, it was at the cost, at, you know, this young man's life. Um, and, you know, a lot of prosecutors' offices are focusing on changing incentives right now, um, but you're right, traditionally prosecutors have been told it's our job to prosecute cases, um, and, you know, that's, that's their sort of very specific myopic role in the system, but that's starting to change, and we're starting to see, um, you know, the Brooklyn DA's office, um, the Philadelphia DA's office, really right. starting to think about, you know, what cases should their office be spending their time on, um, but again, you know, this, this is... Um, these, these prosecutors are being elected, um, and it's going to take decades to, to really yeah. change practices. We have time for um, one more question. Pressure. Two. 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 Okay, great. <laughs> um, so my question pretty much flows, I guess, from what you guys were just talking about, and I am here on a break from 100% Street. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, all of those very much resonates. Um, and one thing that occurred to me when you were talking about sort of how we are now in a much more managerial process and how you are waving around the letter. I've never gotten one from a, from a pastor, but certainly from my social worker or from other people in the office, that we, as a defense community, have been focusing more in the last decade or so on holistic defense, right? And so that means defending other aspects of um, your client's life, in terms of housing, immigration, et cetera, but also in terms of looking at the client as a whole client and understanding what their mental health issues are, what other um, what are the problems are bringing them into contact with the criminal justice system. Um, and I'm curious about to what degree, in addition to, I guess, sort of larger level incentives changing, in terms of just thinking about which cases to prosecute, in your experience talking to prosecutors, um, sort of in the more abstract and not, you know, as I'm talking about the individual case and trying to sort of assess where the author stands on it, um, to what degree they really are learning about that they are practicing in sort of a holistic prosecution uh, system where they are supposed to, or like how we, you know, I was just talking with my, with my colleague that we sort of have to train the baby prosecutors, that we sort of teach them like, you know, that it is the mental health issue that brought this client to, you know, shoplift or towards the drug problem, et cetera, et cetera. And we're trying to sort of, you know, and, you know, yeah, teach them, I guess, a little bit. Yeah. But I'm not sure whether any of that is being, is happening yeah. in terms of the, in terms of uh, training within the DA's offices. Yeah, um, that's I'm curious question. whether you. Yeah, that makes sense. Really it's good. so interesting that I, that's it's such a great question because you know I, the, this court of appeals case came out what yesterday on, um, yes, and that that uh, a B misdemeanor that carries with it the threat of deportation. Now the Sixth Amendment right to jury trial must attach. So as 
many people may or may not know there is a statutory right to a jury trial in New York State for both A and B misdemeanor, except for New York City, which I think um, raises serious equal protection claim. If someone wants to do that with me, let me know. Um, but so now the, and so and as every, anyone, Mayor, as you probably know very well, the prosecutors keep the case as an A to get the benefit of a longer speedy trial time. And then the second it's about to go to trial, they reduce it to a B so that it's a bench trial and not a jury trial. Um, and so the court said, look, when you carries with it the risk of deportation, it's no longer a petty offense for constitutional purposes. And I'm hoping that cases like that will kind of break down. They still talk in this terms of collateral versus non-collateral, direct versus non-direct. But I'm hoping that we're on a doctrinal path to break down, to understand that society expresses its um, opinion of how serious an offense is, not just in the penal law, but in all the attendant sort of statutory civil provisions that make exclusions based on those convictions. And, and so the fact that you can be evicted from NYCHA, the fact that you can't get student loans for certain sort of uh, misdemeanors, I think, for all people, they're no longer petty offenses, frankly. And so I think that that, that right should be extended um, you know, for those reasons. And I think in some offices, prosecutors start to realize that. And then you do see this recognition around the letter, right? Around the transition from ACDs, discons, and actually taking the criminal conviction. But I don't think it's enough. Um, and I think one simple answer is that they just don't spend time with clients. They don't spend time talking to people to really understand the profound ways that these things are affecting their lives or about the procedural hassle of the engagement, right? I mean, to just say, well, then he should fight his case, you know, sometimes would come off as just shockingly callous. Like, do you have any idea what it entails to get here eight times and what real poverty is? Like, a swipe is not, is like two swipes in a day for someone who's in real poverty is a lot of money. And the fact that you think that that's silly, that they didn't have $7, is, is sort of shocking sometimes. Um, so I think not enough, but that's a really important question. And at 100 Sunday I have a question. If anyone is here from the Manhattan Days office, any moles in the room, um, please tell me, and I've been asking every appearance I've done for the last five months, with the cases that they're DPing, the turnstile jumps, are they actually sealing them or are they maintaining the records? I'm, I'm very curious about this, if anyone knows. Um, please tell me, or if you know, please tell me. <laughs> okay, ask around and then email me. I'm on the World Wide Web too. <laughs> and also, as to your question, so there are groups working with prosecutors' offices to train them a little bit more holistically, the way you were talking about. So um, the Brennan Center is working with Fair and Just Prosecution to work with prosecutors' offices to um, provide additional experiential opportunities to them. You know, a lot of um, junior ADAs have never been to a jail or a prison, yeah. and they are sending those people there. And some judges have never actually yeah. been to a prison, um, which is very frightening. And so, you know, we're very aware of that work and undertaking that. Um, Adam right. Foss is doing work in Philadelphia right now, training prosecutors. So that's very much, um, you know, something that I think um, folks working in this reform community um, know is a hole and needs to be filled. So. That's great. Thank you. And, and our last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. All right. um, one of the things that I'm curious if you come across in your research is sort of the, what do you think about technology and artificial intelligence and the role that it's going to play in the future of the criminal justice system. So uh, earlier you talked about bail. Um, and I know New Jersey and, and Cleveland as well, there are a couple of jurisdictions that are using artificial intelligence to basically figure out risk, right? And I think the argument, the pro-argument being made is that it overcomes bias. Um, but there's also another practical reason for it, which you alluded to, is the sheer size of the system, right? It makes things go smoother, it makes it go easier. So I'm wondering, have you sort of encountered this across your research, and, and what do you overall think uh, is going to be the role of these types of technology in the future of our systems? That is uh, such a great question to end on. Um, so the first thing that I'll say is that one of the things that I think that I came to appreciate in, in this research is that scarcity has an upside and that it's that it forces actors to choose amongst what they value. And so um, one of the things that's fucked up about fees and fines is that it allows s systems to be 
bigger than what we're willing to pay for, right? So the idea is that you're going to arrest, if you want to have this massive system, this, you know, that's just pulling people in and you're going to fund it by taking from them in this incredibly regressive way it means a society is not forced to decide, well, do I really want to pay to have tons of people arrested for pissing on the sidewalk or do I want to pay for public bathrooms so that they don't have to piss on the sidewalk? You know, like, what do I want to do? And, and so I think scarcity has an upside. Um, and I think that's important, especially in the criminal justice system. Um, because, you know, I think if we had trials in all these cases, unfortunately, a lot of people would be walking around with criminal convictions, you know, because a lot of people smoke weed. It makes you feel good. Like, it releases stress, you know. I don't like it. It makes me very paranoid. But, like, a lot of people <laughs> like it. I like other things. Like, I like alcohol. And I'm very lucky that it's legal. And so I, I think that, like, that there's a... I don't want to tell the story that, oh, what would be great if we just had enough money to have trials for everyone. So I, so the, there's an interesting point to your question that there's an upside to scarcity. And the second is a segue into my current, my new project um, is really about how we think about discrimination, how we prove it with quantitative research, and it has a huge implications for this machine learning, artificial intelligence. It's something I'm absolutely obsessed with. And I will say that I have huge beefs with the way that almost everyone kind of approaches the question of discrimination and algorithmic prediction, which which is, oh, if they just have the same X's and it spits out the same Y, then that's non-discriminatory. And I think that's deeply problematic if the entire problem of discrimination is that we have a world in which doesn't produce gr by group the same X's, right? Like if it's highly, it's like saying, well, we're gonna treat, you know, Female CEOs and male CEOs both have the same probability of being, you know, president. We're going to randomly select our president from female, from CEOs. You know, well, if, if part of the problem of sexism is that men and women don't have the same probability to become CEOs, it's not... It's not an answer in fairness to say, well, conditional on being CEO, you have the same probability of being selected. And I think that that's um, something that is a problematic sort of an equal protection doctrine all the way down to how computer scientists are thinking about this. So it's an incredibly important issue. Um, and uh, um, unfortunately, I think that's going to be my next book. <laughs> well, well, we'll have you back. And maybe we can get some, some wine. We can, we can yes. have some wine together next right. time, because I also <laughs> like wine. Thank you. Um, so our our huge thanks um, Thank to Isa Kohler Houseman. I mean, today was this was so much fun. I really enjoyed this Thank conversation. You. Associate professor of law and sociology at Yale University and author of her new book. You can hold it up. Misdemeanor Land: Criminal Courts and Social Thank Control you. in the Age of Broken Windows Policing. Again, um, Thank you so there much is a the bookseller audience. in the back of the room. I would urge all of you to um, read this book. Isa will be signing copies in the back of the room. Um, I am L.B. Eisen from the Brennan Center. Please keep up with our work online. I've said it five times now, but I'll say it again. <laughs> BrennanCenter.org. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Watch our videos on YouTube. Listen to our podcasts, including this one, on iTunes. And um, thank you to our audience here at NYU Law School and all of those people listening online. Thank you. Thank you so much, L.B. Thank you.